Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today for today's Zoom chat flying across Australia to all parts of this country to speak to some of the fantastic artists in this year's National Works on Paper. I want to start by acknowledging and paying respect to the elders, families and ancestors of the Bunurong, Boonurong people who have been the custodians of this land for many thousands of years. We acknowledge that the land on which I'm standing is the place of age old ceremonies, celebrations, initiation and renewal, and that the Bunurong, Boonurong people living culture continues to have a unique role in the life of this region. So my name's Danny Lacey. I'm the Artistic Director and Senior Curator at the Mornington Peninsula Regional Gallery. And I'm currently standing in the main gallery at the NPRG in front of this beautiful sculptural work by Judy Holding. Um, we'd like to introduce ourselves around the room. I'll start with you, Robert Ewing. Where are you coming from, Robert? Hi, Danny. Uh, um, from Western Australia, Pinjarra. Uh, beautiful sunny day today. It's pretty hot here today. Uh, I think it's about 37 or so. Um, yeah, but I'm in the office there looking at it across the garden there, so it's really nice. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you. I mean, this is great. I mean, it's good to see everybody. And the fact that we're all sort of, all these different parts of Australia are talking together now is it's great. It's fantastic. Yeah, well, if there's one advantage of the um, crazy year that we had last year is that uh, this sort of connection um, is becoming much more common. Um, we're all getting used to Teams and Zoom and um, this online uh, way of communicating. So, yeah, thanks so much for joining us way out west. Uh, Winsome, welcome. Hi, um, I'm in Darwin and um, it's stopped raining. It's been raining for the last two weeks constantly. So. Everything's very damp. Um, I'm on Larrakia country. Um, and yeah, this is sort of, even though I'm a bit nervous, but I do this for work because I teach art by correspondence. And so we've been using Zoom a lot. But yeah. Anyway, it's good being here. Yeah, so nice to have you with us today. Thanks for joining. Uh, Robert Fielding, hello. Good afternoon. On behalf of Mimli, I'd like to acknowledge, you know, the representation that we had with the National Works on Paper. And like I come from Mimli community, which is located on the Arnhem or Wingera Yankanjara lands. And, you know, we have a diversity of work. And, you know, to showcase my work with you, Rob, and to be acquired by the gallery, it's been a bonus and an honor. And, you know, with COVID 19, I'd like to acknowledge each and every one that I'm looking at on the screen also and just. You know, congratulations with all your work and, you know, the work that you're sharing from the north to the south, to the east, to the west, from the Manda to the Uru, from the Uru to the Manda, you know, from the ocean to the desert, how we are showcasing our work at Monitoring Peninsula and it's been an honour for people to see our work and to see my work also in Ngarampawanka. Mm. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, we are really thrilled to be able to acquire your work, Robert. Um, You've been a finalist a number of times in the National Works on Paper, and uh, we just happened to choose probably the biggest work you've ever entered uh, to bring into the collection. So um, we're gonna have to find somewhere to store it. We've got some storage issues here, but no, thank you so much. Um, it's lovely to have your work on display and um, have you with us today. Uh, Tamika, welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, firstly, thank you for the invitation to be a part of this really interesting and new way of having a bit of an artist talk and conversation together. Um, and also for selecting my work to be part of National Works on Paper. It's like honestly a great thing to hear out of last year as well and the opportunity to take a part of me also interstate into another place where I can't really travel to anymore. It's nice to know that my artwork can still travel and be around other people across Australia while we're all in this um, in and out of isolation um, COVID times. Um, so yeah, I'm predominantly a printmaker working in relief print. So the yeah, the work that we have in National Works on Paper is probably one of my more significant works coming into being an emerging and professional artist. Um, I live and work in Brisbane, Australia, and I'd also like to acknowledge the younger and terrible people from where I'm from at the moment. Well, thank you. Welcome. So nice to see your face. So yeah. nice to see all of you, actually. I've, I've missed seeing artists, speaking to artists mm -hmm. and having artists in the building. So it's nice to see you. Um, on screen. Kath, 
Welcome. Where are you at the moment? Um, I'm in Sydney on Gadigal land and it's quite noisy outside at the moment. So I hope that noise doesn't come in too much. Uh, it's so lovely being here with everybody and having this connection. I've also really missed having openings and artist talks and getting to see people and being able, yeah, it's, it's been um, strange not being able to travel interstate. Um, I had hoped to get down to Victoria to see this exhibition, but it hasn't worked out. So it's lovely to be able to join everybody online to talk about our work today. Yeah, welcome. And Arnika, uh, it's so nice to see you again. Uh, Arnika actually came down to the MPRG last week, so it was great to uh, welcome her into the space and to um, record a little podcast and do some little filming. So um, welcome, Arnika. Where are you at the moment? Very industrial looking background. It's funny. I think I'm sitting in front of an air conditioning unit at the National Gallery in Canberra. Um, so I'm joining you from the nation's capital, but on unceded Ngambri and Ngunnawal country. So I acknowledge my um, their uh, traditional custodianship of this land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, really nice to see you guys here, but also to have had the chance to see the beautifully curated exhibition and congrats on all the stunning works. Um, you've created. Yeah, well, welcome. And Jane, Jaman, who I hardly ever get to introduce in our public programs online. So welcome to you. It's nice to see you um, on screen showing your face. Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, we might, do you want to share your screen, Jane? And uh, we'll get into it. We're going to start with you, Robert Ewing. Uh, over in the West. Um, and I'm not sure how I came up with this order. I, did, I was, don't know if I was trying to get it west to east or something, but um, the title of this work is quite interesting. Fred and Ginger disguised as imaginary forms within a landscape setting. Maybe yeah. that's a nice place to start. Um, yeah. We'll talk about this work a little bit. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Danny. Yeah, okay, well, um, you know, I did not know what the title was, go was going to be before I started work. Um, I just simply wanted two forms. Um, and I've been working on these sort of imaginary type forms uh, for quite a, a bit. And so that's where I started with these two forms. And I guess I had in, in, in my mind this sort of possibly a masculine, possibly a feminine type of sort of association with these forms. And, um, and so then I developed up from, from uh, there. And you know, like, like when I started this, it, it really is, I just start from a very basic, you know, premise I, I think of what where am I going to have the light coming from um, left or right up down or whatever and then you know is it going to be one form two form is it going to be like a, a bit of a landscape thing in the background and then from there I just start drawing I don't know what the forms look like and I start and and so then that sort of determines what the next form is going to be like and then I'm sort of then I'm in the quest then of balancing out what I'm doing and, and, and trying to make sense of it all and pulling it together as it's happening, you know? So it's, so it's very much a thing that's sort of coming together um, as it's being made. And what's happening before is determining what's coming next. So it's that sort of process, which makes for a spectacular failure. <laughs> or, you know, uh, um, something that sort of works, you know, and, um, and, and, then when I was finished with it, I thought, okay, what am I going to call this thing? You know, I'm not a clue, you know. And then, and, and so that sort of really brought about a, a big thing because I started to sort of name stuff, you know, and then, uh, and then the naming of it starts to become important. You know, it starts to have a meaning and then it starts to suggest things within the artwork. And so, and, um, and so, then I think, okay, people are responding to that and it might be political, it might be gender-based, whatever, you know. Um, and, and then I think, okay, well, that's what people are responding to, then maybe I should do more of that, you know. And so, and then it becomes a bit of a chore trying to work out what the title's going to be for these things, you know. And, and so, um, but um, I think with this particular piece, uh, Fred and Ginger, I, I sort of, you know, didn't want it to be too serious. Um, because you know, there's enough sort of serious, enough serious stuff going on anyway, um, and I didn't want it to be a downer in in any sense. So um, I wanted to have a bit of humour about it, and 
then uh, then also there was a sense of nostalgia, something that's already happened. Um, it's in the past. Um, so, and I quite remembered um, when I was a kid growing up, this Ginger uh, Rogers and Fred Astaire, the great dancers, you know, um, and, and there's a sense of drama about them and that was really great because uh, I was a real TV kid when I was growing up. Uh, I watched TV TV. And um, um, I was also outside a lot too, but anyway. Um, yeah, and, and so Fred and Ginger disguised as imaginary forms within a landscape setting. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know, it, it, it seemed to sound okay. <laughs> and it seemed like I could get away with it, so <laughs> so I thought, why not give it a go? You know? um, and so, um, yeah, and yeah, I mean, because really, you know, no matter what I think about the work, and I could talk for hours about the, the work and different symbolism that I've developed over time, and why I put it in there, and um, the different perspectives that I put in it and stuff. That's fine for me because that's where I'm coming from, you know. But if I start laying that on somebody else, and that, I think it could be, oh, wow, well, really? It's a bit of a drag, you know, or it's a bit of a chore, you know. <laughs> oh, my God, I didn't think that was a bit, what the artwork was about. It's a bit of a downer now, or it's a, you know, I mean, and it takes away, it, or can take away, that sort of sense of that personal dialogue that I get when I look at an artwork. Like when I look at artwork, I really don't want to have to read a, a ring of paper about it to understand it. I don't really even concerned about this title. I just want to connect with it, you know. And when I see it from a distance, I want to be intrigued by it enough to maybe want to go closer. And as I start that journey of going closer to the work, I want to be informed by new things. So the closer I move to this piece, I start to learn, I see nuances about it. I see some, oh, I didn't see that before when I was back there. And then as I'm getting closer and closer, I'm becoming more and more intimate with the piece. And there's that personal journey of, of me going from this spot, from viewing to looking at it quite closely. And that's a very intimate personal process that's unique for everybody, you know. Um, and sometimes it can be a very scary process, you know, going into this thing and thinking, well, well you about that you know or wow this is really nice and exciting and here I go I'm starting to drift off and I'm quite happy about this and I'm starting to meander now through this thing and I'm saying no there's that little bit of line over there that's quite nice you know and then I can sort of just lose myself in just the fact of what it is it doesn't have to mean anything it can just be something that's entertaining and is exciting and it's yeah um, something that is worth the journey to look closer at. Yeah, that's great. Um, we might go move on to Winsome. We'll just bring up your image. Winsome. Ah, okay. Um, well, cycads. Cy well, cycads are my favourite plant, um, and they're really iconic to the top end savanna. Um, and I've been, I suppose, painting or printing using the cycad in my imagery for a long time, and as well as sand palms. And this is part of a body of work I've been working on where they're more like sketches in paper. So I'm letting the paper speak more. So this is all handmade paper. So, um, before I even get the print images or have an idea of what I'm going to do, I have to make all the paper first. So always I've got a sort of idea in the back of my mind. And so for this one, most of my work is about our impact on the natural environment. And um, so being able to collect the plants and then make the paper out of it adds another layer of message and meaning and connection for me to what I'm talking about. And it enables me, I think, to get really intimate with the plants um, and the environment because I uh, collect at different times of the year. So it's the wet season at the moment. I've just been out and collected some spear grass. Um, and I've got to go out next week and get some gamba grass. I think I'm getting confused. Anyway, 
Um, so this piece, so I made the paper first. So the paper is made with gamba grass, which is um, a noxious weed, declared noxious weed. It was introduced into the territory as a cattle feed. And it is having a really detrimental effect because of the bushfires it generates. Um, so the fires are really hot, really intense, really high up in the tree canopies and are starting to destroy native plants. Um, so I've used gamba grass. The other thing in it is it's watermarked. So those lozenge shaped um, patterns in it are a watermark. The paper, there's three layers of paper um, with inclusions in between. So the black in underneath in various places that's peeking through those lighter spaces is um, pulp painted layered in underneath. Um, so I do all that first. So I've made all the paper, I've dried it, um, and then I start working on the imagery. And I have a series of plates. Uh, my printing plates are all fairly experimental, sort of industrial. I use plastics a lot. And this particular plate is a white plastic called hips and I've used a Dremel to draw into it. I've sandblasted it to get tonal variations, a bit like aqua tint, <coughs> um, carved into it, polished bits. I've used solvents like Carby Cleaner. Um, it melts the plastic and you press things into it. Um, so that's good. Yeah, so I've got the plate. Um, but then I've also added, before I printed it, I've added that trunk area, which is pulp painting. So I've made pulp with um, probably gamber and spear grass and drawn with it. So I've drawn that black and gold um, tree trunk. And I've drawn the, um, the cycad leaves and I've stitched those down to the paper and then I've printed over the top of it. So it's a really uh, long process from beginning to end. Um, and at the moment, I think I'm trying to let the paper speak more and, uh, and the stitching, I think, to instead of gluing things, so I'm stitching, which to me is a bit like mending, repairing, um, what else? Anyway, I love paper. It's just the most amazing stuff and you can do so many things with it. And what else? Oh, there was one thing, yeah, the idea of, oh, cycads. The other reason, yeah, cycads. So they've been around since the Jurassic, which is pretty amazing and they've hardly changed, but I mean, anything could happen now. And the other thing, you'll you new people out in um, Eastern Arnhem Land, they consider, or the cycad is a metaphor for a custodian or a guardian, which is just such a gorgeous um, idea because they have been around for so long. They're so slow growing and they're like, to me, they're like records of the past and the present just watching to see what's going to happen next because they've been around for so long. Um, and I think that's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. I could talk forever about paper making. That's, um, that's beautiful. The, um, the work itself has an amazing texture to it, which is really hard to replicate on screen. It's just so beautiful in the, the layering and the different textures. Um, yeah, it's quite sensational. Robert, this is um, a stunning work, quite a large scale work as well, 192 centimetres high in two parts. I'd love to uh, hear more about this work. What would you like to share about this work with us? Ngunnawal Wonga, it's about um, our language and like it's how important our language, our story, our song is important, like Nyundumba, like you. 
but it's about Nyondaba also. It's about Nyondaba, your story, your wanka, your speaking, and it's about oh, I'm gonna. It's about you know what we're talking about today, but you know it's about everyone showcasing their work and you know telling their stories of you know the Syed and the, you know the ginger just then, and you know it's about telling stories and it's about our language Nyondaba wanka. You know, my practice is about, you know, reconciliation and about holding on to our knowledge, our language, our elders, our chukurva, mil milpa, meaning our land, our stories, and how important it is that chonu, and that we must listen and understand, and that we must listen to our elders. And it's about, you know, piercing. It's about the early piece of artwork that was used on the lands, how they used to do woodwork and that the paper then and piercing with a soldering iron and how in the red one there you'll see Nganamba means ours and you'll see all different motifs there. It's about all the renowned artists within my art center now that, you know, have become very renowned with their artwork, but, you know, putting my artwork with their work, which is Mimli Muggle Arts and how important the Wichity Grub story is about it's all ours and how important it is. And Wanka, then it's about the anatomy. It's about the anatomy of the muscles, the tissues, the sinews, the liver, the lungs, the heart, and how you'll see the leaf-like things, but it's the motifs of laying back the, dissecting, you know, the flesh and that, you know, it's no different to my another body of work, Milkali Kuju, that, you know, it's about, you know, the importance of understanding one another, Ngapuji, Ngapuji. You know, it's thinking about, you know, all the different conflicts that we have and, and how we, there's so much protest happening in a, our country and all over the world. And this time, of, you know, it's about the social change, you know, with this work of Nganapa Wonka, and which has taken me down to different roads of who I am as an artist and, you know, who I am as an individual and, you know, using other people's ideas and, you know, using that in my work. And with the piercing, it's very... I think I'm the only one that does piercing, I'm not quite sure, with a soldering iron and, you know, how important it is that you can give a piece of paper another purpose and, you know, another meaning and another, you know, projection of, like, when you look at it properly, you can see that, you know, it's about, you know, the conflicts of what I was talking about, you know, it's like bulletproof, bullet holes and everything in it, like, whichever way you look at it. And it's about, you know the language and how important the language is of Wanka. And that, you know, our language is very difficult to understand and to think, and English is very difficult to understand also. And how important that Wanka is about communication, is about understanding and it's about interpretation. You know, it's about, you know, listening to our elders and listening to our men and women that come into our communities to help and assist us, you know, whether it's in Dalkana, Mimili, Frigan, Nunavala, Amara, Kanpi, Napuri, you know, the, which makes up the APY lands, that we have to be Ngapuji, Ngapuji, we have to learn and listen from one another. But the main thing is about, it's about language and how important Nganampa, Nganampa is ours. And while you're here in this short period of time, you must appreciate and to understand and acknowledge and to see the secrecy of our country and to take you to places that you don't get the opportunity and, you know, to, for people that work in art centers, you know, they see these diversity of artworks and they go to country and see these types of work, whether it's my work, you know, and other works, it's how important it is. Nganampa, ours. And Wanka, at the end of the day, it's about fight. You know, how you can fight before without weapons now and, you know, how you can fight with art and how you can tell a story through your artwork and how important it is that, you know, this is your way of showing people a different form of art through piercing. Like when you look at it again, like I said just then, it's about piercing, it's about projection, it's about bullet holes also that you'll see on both sides and either way, it's like projection. You give, I take, I take, you give, ngapuji, ngapuji. And it's about Wanga, it keeps us strong and it's about connected to our roots and who we are as, you know, custodians and First Nations of our country and that our space is only a space that you're entitled to, but, you know, you must acknowledge and appreciate and respect other boundaries of languages. And it's about Nganampa Wanga, again, like I said, it's about languages and 
you know, we as Arnang, we have so many languages, and, you know, how important it is that we must respect those languages and respect our tradition, our culture. And we must also, when we leave our communities and go to places, it's about we must respect the places of other custodians of past, present, future, quarting or laerity, you know, meaning the past, the present, the future. And it's by acknowledging these languages and that we must hold on to these stories of our elders that give us this opportunity to showcase your work in another form of art. And instead of a canvas or whatever, my work is very diverse and, you know, but to put it on paper and to pierce it, it was like the old artwork where it was made from porn of wood and walka and everything, you burn it with a hot iron and making these animals that are, you see in Maraku in Muritulu es rock and that had these other places. But to pierce it, you know, it was very unique, I think so anyways. And I've looked around at a lot of art people's artwork and you don't see this form of art, but you know, to be standing with these prestigious men and women here today and to showcase our work and, you know, to be acquired and to be looked upon with importance in that we are the master of what we do. And, you know, for the foreseer, for the person to see our work, you know, it's up to them to decide on how they see art and how they appreciate art. And within this artwork, there's my children also. I have nine children also. And, you know, how important within this work, how important it is that they have a story also, electric fields also. And, you know, another son I have also, it's about how important it is, you know, underneath the Robert D. Costello Foundation that he's ran three marathons with him and, you know, he's very thing, but it's about ours and how important it is that there's so many people within our communities that have these skills and of showcasing their art and, you know, whether it's English language or work or art or drama or sports or that and it's about Nganampa, it's from our communities and it's about us giving to the Uru, to the Manda, from the Manda to the Uru, from the ocean to the desert that, you know, we are brothers and sisters no matter what and that, you know, our artwork is our artwork and how we can give people the strength of appreciating one another's work through art and to celebrate and to be part of this roots and roots and routine of, you know, creating art for the country and the world to see and how important it is that, you know, your work is internationally also and that it's in your own country and how important it's a joint future that there will be many more behind me that will, you know, submit a piece of artwork. My other colleague, Linda Puno, also got acquired by, you know, I must acknowledge that also, that she was acquired by Monitoring Peninsula and how important it is that we got two birds with one stone and, you know, to showcase our work. And it's about Nganampa Wanka, Nyurampa. It's about Ngali, it's about us, the people that we work with that, you see the diversity of works that are coming and going and raw work. And this is a raw piece of artwork and it's about piercing and it's about holding on to and it's about, you know, celebrating now that I'm speaking with these men and women that are on the opposite side on the screen and, you know, to see their work and, you know, it's inspiring, you know, that we all have different types of work and how paper, is very important also in how it is one. And to showcase under your umbrella of the Mornington Peninsula, you know, it's an honor to be showcasing and it's an honor to be showcasing my work alongside the award winners. And palya, that's it. But, you know, it's about Nganampa, it's about ours and it's about yours. You know, it's about Wankara. It's about everybody that we are equal and our work is paper and which is bark, which is wood and porno and you know how important it is that we are one when it comes to paper. Rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> Thank you so much Robert. Um, yeah you're right it's it's quite amazing to see 
all of these works made on paper and just the diversity and um, yeah, it was a, such a tough job for the judges this year um, because the standard is just so incredibly high um, from nearly 1200 applications across the country um, to get that down to the 76 artists who are finalists. Um, and then to see all the works in person, they just, uh, it's just, it seriously is, there's so much beautiful work here. It's a pity we couldn't acquire everything. Uh, Tamika, I'd love to hear more about this um, stunning multi-panelled work of yours. Um, yeah, sure. So I'm just trying to think about where to start. <laughs> um, so with this work, um, I did this work in 2019 and it was actually created um, because I was invited to be a part of the Cairns Indigenous Art Fair with my represented gallery, uh, One Space, um, in 2019. Um, and the directors, John and Jody, really gave me the freedom to just kind of go ahead and do something large and big and really explore some of the themes and, um, I guess, artistic practices that I was starting to undertake um, out of my first year of uni. Um, with this work, um, it has like a few different elements that I draw on both um, about my cultural identity and also connection to nature as well. Um, growing up, I um, didn't really have a lot of connection with my non-Western um, heritages, with like Islander and my Papua New Guinea Guinean heritages. Um, so what I discovered while um, being at university and um, finding relief print carving is that um, the practices of carving is quite pro predominant in those um, cultural practices. Um, and it really gave me this opportunity to try and like explore my cultural identity and heritage through the act of actually carving liner cut and um, really embracing that relief print carving. Um, what I, I noticed while I was like, younger and researching into these um, like different artists that use relief print carving is that especially indigenous culture there's always like a motif that's quite strong to an individual how that reflects them as an individual or as a like their country and where they're from and um i never had that growing up as well so i decided to make my own motif uh which is repeated four times across this big two by 202.7 meter panel um the motif was actually drawn from a my form that I made from a minute area of native flora from when I was in high school about 10 years ago. And I realized that this motif was just actually popping up in my practice and I was using it in paintings and drawings and um, just kind of integrating it into my artwork no matter what medium I was working with, um, quite, being quite unaware that that was happening until I was out of uni in 2019 and reflected back on that. So. Yeah, there's, there's this motif that I use and each motif has a different form of carving or um, kind of an aesthetic to it where they um, come and they flow in and out of each other through the carving that I do. Um, I mainly work with local or native flora or, and also introduce flora to my local area. And I really like to find the minute aspects of the flora where I try to enhance the parts that often would have gone unnoticed and really work with these different patterns and forms that can then intertwine, intertwine and create something new. Um, but yeah, with this work, it really helped me also kind of go into other works where I started to really, I don't know, embrace the working in large scale and trying to refine my carving styles as well. Um, I'm not too sure what else to <laughs> talk about of this work, but um, yeah, there's quite a lot of different bits and pieces that um, make up this work. And I did lean towards doing um, these, these panel works where they kind of visit like an assemblage of prints that make up something whole. And it was something that I just kind of did intuitively um, coming out of university. Like I really liked the process of kind of creating this jigsaw puzzle where there was this map and this, all of these new forms started to create out of this whole just by putting the pieces together. Um, but then I also was thinking about these um, kind of that representation of using these carp lines to represent story and having the gaps, the white gaps between the works kind of reflect the 
um, parts of my heritage and the parts of my own story that have been missed or I don't completely know what leads into what. So that's, um, yeah, this work was definitely a big, big mission, um, but it really gave me the confidence to move into this discipline and doing works on paper as well. Yeah, and thank you for the very exacting install instructions. <laughs> they were very helpful. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Complex <laughs> in the way that all the multi panels, the individual panels, to actually get them lined up with those negative spaces in in the actual mix. But um, yeah, your instructions were were fantastic. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, Kath, you're up next. We'll just uh, get your. Yeah. The hive drawing. Um, I'd love to hear more about this work and how it was produced. Ah, thank you. Well, it's a collaborative drawing um, and a particip participatory drawing. So, um, and the other uh, two times that it's been exhibited, I've invited people to draw on it with me. And the idea of the work is that it's based on um, a honeybee's um, hive of their colony and how honeybees all work together to build the beehive. And when the bees make the wax comb, the beeswax comb, the youngest bees secrete the beeswax in little scales from under their wings and their older sister bees pull them out with their legs and then they shape this around one of the bees' bodies to get the exact size that they want and then they push it with their legs so that all these little <laughs> cylinders all get pushed together. Um, and then because it's quite warm in the beehive, it's about uh, 36 degrees, the, be the wax is quite soft so gravity pulls all of these little cylinders down and together and the chemical composition of the beeswax makes it form <coughs> And hexagonals. Um, so the idea with this drawing was to bring people together to work together collaboratively to build the drawing together. So I made um, beeswax crayons and people would crouch down next to the work and put their hand down next to one of the circles that was already there and draw around the outside of their hand with the beeswax crayon and then they would get some turmeric from a little container and get it on the end of their fingertip and dust around the circle. Because the beeswax was quite difficult to see on the black paper. But then with the turmeric on top of it, it made it kind of pop out. And the turmeric ha has a really amazing smell as well as color. And the beeswax has quite a strong smell as well. So it becomes a very kind of multi-sensual work. It's a, not just the visual, but it's also the touch and the smell and the sort of bodily movement around it as well. Um, so I had a lot of fun working with many different people working on this drawing to make it bigger and to, and people would say to me, oh, I can't draw. And I was like, oh, that's okay. It's very simple. You just, just draw it. You're just tracing around your hand. Um, and the idea of bringing people together to um, work socially, to construct something together, built a really kind of strong um, bond and almost kind of emotional atmosphere to the work. It was really interesting to see how people would um, sit around the work together to talk and draw on it and children would get very involved and they'd get very excited with the turmeric and sometimes there'd be a lot of turmeric everywhere. But um, it, it was a really enjoyable work. Um, I should say about the turmeric, initially I thought I would collect yellow pollen and use yellow pollen to um, add this uh, powdered yellow element to the work. And of course, uh, bees collect pollen for their hive as well. Um, but then the reality of trying to collect enough yellow pollen to do this set in and I was like, oh, I don't think I've quite got the, the capability to collect that much pollen. Um, there's a German artist, Wolfgang Leib, who, um, uses pollen in his work and there's some great footage of him going around with a little jar and a paintbrush and dusting the pollen off into the jar. So I tried doing that and then realised actually for the scale of this work it wasn't going to be sufficient. 
Um, and then I thought of turmeric because it is such a, a wonderful golden color. And it's a really interesting spice that has so many medicinal properties as well. Um, I know a number of people who take turmeric quite regularly as an anti-inflammatory and it's uh, really helpful with arthritis and things like that. So in a sense, uh, having to crouch down next to the work to draw on it, it was kind of um, fun that there was this relationship between the medicinal property of the turmeric as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I suppose um, it's definitely the biggest drawing I've ever done. I when I, I moved into a studio a couple of years ago and some artists were moving out and the guy running the studio was clearing out space and he had this huge roll of photographer's backdrop paper. Um, and he's like, oh, I don't know what to do with this. It's a bit water damaged. I think I'm just gonna take it to the tip. And I was like, oh no, no, I would like to keep it. I, I don't know what I want to do with it at the moment, but I'll think of something. Um, and then in the course of, of planning some different projects, the idea of doing a collaborative drawing came up and I've done a lot of work with beeswax and um, other sculptures and installations and drawings. So this, the idea for this work just sort of evolved. And um, yeah, it's quite exciting that it's gonna keep going. Um, it's been a bit difficult, I think with COVID to have the drawing sessions take place because you do end up being in quite close proximity to other people. So we'll see how we go over time. Hopefully there'll be some opportunities to find some other large gallery spaces to roll it out and keep the drawing going with different people. Mm. Great, thank you. Annika, um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your um, winning work, Endurance 5. So my work, Endurance 5, is a, a large scale multi-panel uh, watercolour monotype on paper, so it might be hard to see on the digital image, but there's nine, nine separate pieces of paper involved. Um, and that's partly practical because they're the sort of size of, of paper, 56 by 76, that can fit through the etching press that I use to transfer the watercolour from a plastic plate onto that um, damp, soft etching paper. Um, but it's also a really nice part of the process in terms of making something big and ambitious seem um, more more possible, more approachable, um, I guess, from wanting to convey the experience of being in the landscape, um, not just what it looks like, but sort of my bodily experience of, of feeling dwarfed by, you know, these ancient rock formations and um, vast coastal uh, environments, I really felt like I needed to expand to something that was larger than my body. Um, and so I've kind of approached it by one mark at a time, um, thousands of small, uh, mostly finger marks, so wiping away with a damp cloth around my finger, taking away some of that saturated uh, ultramarine, ultramarine blue watercolour and um, adding back in <coughs> with the brush. So it's something that I can start to slowly see the image um, evolving and, and coming together as I um, piece one panel uh, next to the other and it's, you know, it's a place that's important to me, um, a sort of personally significant place. Uh, this is Gorilla Bay on Ewan country on the New South Wales South Coast um, that's inspired the work. Um, it was sort of walking in that environment um, and also spending time there with my family. Um, it was sort of the last summer of my mum's life that I was wanting to look back on um, and to bring that kind of memory and imagination as well as what I could see, but um, using the more evocative or emotionally charged color of, of blue. Um, something that the writer, Rebecca Solnit, whose audio books I often listen to in the studio, um, she was talking about the blue of distance, um, it being a, the kind of color of solitude and, and desire, the place um, that was all the way on the distant horizon um, kind of somewhere that you could never quite get to um, because no matter as you approach the horizon the, the blue is going to keep um, eluding you and, and sort of being further off into the distance. Uh, some of my earlier works I'd kind of really struggled or avoided including the horizon at all because it suddenly makes the work read as a, a landscape or a seascape but in this one I sort of 
really embraced that area um, and let the, the watercolor medium, especially as how it fluid it flowed across the, the plastic um, non-absorbent plate that I was painting on, it just made that area um, almost to me, to me, it looks like a, a kind of an approaching storm or maybe a release of, of water from the sky. Uh, other people who've looked at it have seen tree forms and sort of much more ambiguous what's happening up at the horizon compared to the maybe the you know really detailed rock formations that are down at your feet. So really as the, I just wanted the viewer as they're approaching it to be able to almost feel that they could step into the into the work. If they're sort of looking down at the rock pool and the and the rocks and then out into the distance. Um, even though it was something that for me has a lot of um, you know personal significance significance and is going to remain a place that's kind of a touchstone to go back to. Uh, I think there's more of a general pull that that draws people to connect with with the ocean and with the coast. Um, from living in an inland place in Canberra, I know that everyone uh, sort of, uh, you know, has this connection to the coast that they build over their, their lifetime. And I'm sure that's familiar with lots more people around Australia as well. Oh, yeah. Great. Thank Glad you. To be part of the exhibition. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone. It's been so nice to um, hear from all of you from all parts of the country. Um, we've probably gone a little bit over time, so I might just say a big thank you to each and every one of you, and um, thank you so much for being part of the 2020 National Works on Paper. Uh, it's really been uh, an absolute pleasure to present your work as part of this exhibition and to highlight your practices and to be able to share, um, share your stories with, uh, with our audiences today. So thank you so much for um, joining in today's Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>